and will make him Colonel Willis and make him military governor of Cambridgeburg. I take it Pope is a prohibitionist because he is enthused with one order that Willis ordered, that Ewell orders Willis to inform. All alcohol is to be inventory. <laughs> there to be no sales of alcohol. And he's going to say, Willis does a good job of enforcing prohibition on both the locals and the Confederates. And he wished, when he wrote that book in the 1890s, that your city fathers were as good at enforcing prohibition in the area as Ewell and Willis were. <laughs> so I would take it a hoax is a prohibitionist. <laughs> Probably one that would be following Carrie Nation <laughs> into a bar as she wrecks it. So, so they're going to recognition. <laughs> then Hill, General Hill will arrive on the 26th. And an hour later, Polk is standing there when who arrived? Robert E. Lee. And he stands there and watches as Hill and Lee converse on the 26th, not the 25th, in the, on the diamond. Now, Polk. You always build yourself up when you write your reminiscence. As he's watching, he sees Lee and Hill walking. He sees Hill, Hill lifts his hat off his head, and he notices that Lee takes a turn to the east, looking east on that road that is the National Road and goes to Gettysburg. And he will go to Mr. Hoover, who knows the roads well, and tells Hoover, I think by Lee's, just, by Lee's actions, they're going east when they leave here, for Gettysburg. Hoover will make a Paul Revere ride to both by horseback and train and arrives in, in, in Harrisburg and tells Kirkland that. That's a lead that Lee is going east. That's very good news to General Couch who was in command of the troops at Harrisburg. So you have two Union Corps here. One is not here. And uh, Lee is going to issue orders on the 26th. He's going to draft them in Messerschmitt's Grove. That's on the east side of town closer to town than the bypass. And the orders are that General Ewell is going to the, do the next move. General Ewell will take his men and he will accompany General Rhodes and General Johnston, Allegheny Johnson, divisions, and they'll leave here and en route to Shippensburg, the first stop on their way to Carlisle, where they will start for on the 26th. And General Ewell, General Early with his division starts on the road to Gettysburg, en route to York. And he's a gentleman that will make sure and make a Worst enemy of the South than he'd been heretofore of that Stevens. 
But when he gets there, Stevens' foreman says, we don't make any money here. At the Caledonia Furnace, we give employment to <laughs> poor people in the war. Hurry will say, I never heard of a Yankee in my life that would do such a thing. Because they're interested in profit, not social, social services. And they pursued to burn everything that's burnable at the Caledonia Furnace, except the blacksmith shop. And by nightfall, Hurry's men have routed the 26th Pennsylvania militia and have occupied Kennesburg. During the next, now, by the 28th, we have, where are the Confederates? The Confederates are as follows. General A.B. Hill, with his corps, is camped to the west, east of Chambersburg. In the Chambersburg area are two of Longstreet's divisions, the division of the Claws and the division of, uh, of, of uh, General Hood. Pickett's division has not arrived yet. Now the, uh, we have General Murray by this time is in York with his advanced division a brigade at Columbia. We have uh, Ur, uh, uh, Rhodes, Ewell, and uh, Johnson near Carlisle, and near Fort Hill, we have uh, uh, the, uh, we have the uh, Hills, uh, uh, Ewell's, uh, uh, Ewell's Cavalry, uh, commanded by Jenkins. Now, Lee is sleeping well on the night of the 26th. He doesn't know where Jeb Stewart is. Jeb Stewart, on the 25th day of June, had got used discretionary orders to ride, a, to, ride to, to seek to ride around the Union Army for a third time. Do a repeat of what he had done when he rode around McClellan at the gates of Richmond in the period from the 12th uh, to the 15th of, of, of June of 62, and when he rode around McClellan the second time between the 12th and the 14th of October. And he will take his arm, his corps northward, with the admonition that if the Union Army crosses the Potomac River, he is to let the know immediately. Stuart will make a long detour when he has to bypass the Union Army as it moves north through the toward the Potomac River. Uh, through the Potomac River, Stuart will cross the Potomac River on the night of the 27th and 28th. By which time, the Army of the Potomac is across the Potomac River and in and around Frederick. Stuart will, will then capture a supply train of 125 wagons and start northward to a rendezvous with General Murray in the area of York, Pennsylvania. To Lee, everything is going well. Arriving here, again, pointing out in, how important Jabersburg and uh, Franklin County are. Lee has retired for the night to his headquarters wagon in Messersmith's Grove when Henry George and uh, George Thomas Herring, Harrison shows up at <coughs> Longstreet's headquarters. He is a spy in Longstreet's employment, and he wakes up Longstreet's chief of staff 
and says, I've got bad news. The Union Army is in and around Frederick. Three Corps in west of the Catoctin Mountain, two Corps around Frederick, and uh, they're in motion. Longstreet, Chief of Staff says, we better tell General Lee. So they'll escort Harrison into Lee's headquarters, wake Lee up, like he'll be guided by Major Fairfax of, of Longstreet staff, and he'll inform Lee that the Union Army is north of the Potomac River. The first news that Lee has received is Lee is shocked to find out. He's also concerned because he hasn't heard anything from General Stewart. On the 28th, Stuart had crossed the Potomac River, and by noon on the 28th, he had started northward from Rock, Rock, Rockville, Maryland, to a rendezvous with Hurry, someplace in Pennsylvania. So Lee is confronted with a, a big problem. It is the Union Army is across the Potomac River in Frederick County, and his army is scattered, using a colloquial expression, from hell to Peru. Mm -hmm. From York and Columbia to, to Carlisle, to Hagerstown, uh, to Chambersburg, to Martinsburg. So Lee on the morning of the 28th will issue an important order, and that is that the army is to concentrate. And they're to concentrate on Cashtown Gap. That gap eight miles west of Gettysburg and, and about, ten, uh, about 13 miles east of where we are. So the die has been cast, and the great battle will take place at Gettysburg. The last troops to pass through Chambersburg, <coughs> going to Gettysburg, will be General Pickett's division on the morning of the 12th, uh, on the morning of the uh, the second day of July. So during this crucial period, Chambersburg and Franklin County, and this is the basic staging area, and the places where Lee is making critical decisions, which will have a great effect on him in the battle against us. Chambersburg has felt the hard hand of war. One little humorous story before we go uh, to the, bring the Confederates back through Chamber, through Franklin County. As the Texas Division is moving northward on the, uh, uh, to Chambersburg, to through, uh, uh, through Goldsboro, through uh, Goldsboro on the uh, uh, 26th, they see a very buxom German gal <laughs> standing by the side of the road with a, with a Union flag uh, around her breast. And the Confederates will shout at her, you better watch out. We're pretty good at charging breastworks. <laughs> <laughs> the lady is very embarrassed at that remark. <laughs> the farmers have lost a large, over 5,000 cattle, 1,000 sheep, 
thousands of hogs that were being sent back to Virginia. Well, back now. Use your use your uh, signal map that you have, and you can look at the upper part of your map. This is the one that says uh, from Gettysburg to Hagerstown. Up to the head of your map, on the upper part of the third of the fourth of the map, you can see the boundary, the Mason-Dixon line that separates Pennsylvania from Maryland. Now, the Confederates are not going to be as cocky when they come back as they went north. When they went north, they were talking what they were going to do to the Union. And there was a firm belief among the Confederates that Robert E. Lee was invincible. But, but on the evening of the 3rd, Robert E. Lee realizes his army is not invincible. They've suffered very heavy casualties. They'd come close to victory both on the first and second, but as you know, close only counts in horseshoes. <laughs> and on the third day, as been the disastrous, Pickett, Pettigrew, and Triple Shard. Meanwhile, passing through Harrisburg, having earlier come through Mercersburg, which is, besides being the birthplace of President Buchanan, is in your wonderful county of, of Franklin. With the brigade commanded by John Imboden. Imboden is a Northwestern brigade. Imboden is 40 years old. He had been a businessman and a lawyer in Stanton, Virginia. <coughs> he commanded a battery of artillery at the Battle of First Manassas. <clears throat> and when he organizes the first regiment of, pa of partisans, his rise had been meteoric. And the uh, winter of 1862-63, will find him commanding a brigade serving in Western Virginia, known as the Northwest Brigade, consisting of two regiments, the 14th Virgi 16th Virginia, commanded by John M. Bowden's brother George, and the, 50, and the 62nd Virginia, commanded by George Smith. George Smith would eventually become the stepfather of George Smith Patton II when he marries the widow Patton, plus McClanahan's battery. They crossed the Potomac River over west of, of uh, Chambersburg, had gone through Bloody Run, now Everett, had passed through McConnellsville, had passed through uh, through Mercersburg, and at noon on the second, had left Chambersburg or Gettysburg, arriving at Cache Town, where they had spent the night of the second and third. It rains on the afternoon of the third. And the clouds are building up in the west. And about 11 o'clock on the evening of the 3rd, General Imboden gets orders to report to General Lee's headquarters. Located on Seminary Ridge in the area of the south. When M. Bowden, guided with his, staff, with his chief of staff, arrived there, 
Lee is absent. Soon he'll get orders to wait there till Lee returns. Lee returns at midnight. And his orders to Imboden, since Imboden's brigade had not been engaged as yet, was to take charge of an immense <coughs> wagon train of of ambulances and wagons carrying the Confederate wounded, those who were not uh, who were not too badly wounded that they cannot be moved, and he will take them, see that they are loaded from the central collection area at at Cage Town Gap, coming from the field hospitals and then escort them by the way of Chambersburg back to where they crossed the river at, at Williamsport. Throughout the morning and the afternoon of the 4th, it's a sad and bitter sight. As the ambulances arrive, the wagons arrive with hundreds and thousands of Confederate wounded. They will be loaded into the limited number of ambulances with springs or just the common wagon for a, a trip that will be a trip that, that will be saving from the gates of hell. It begins raining very, very hard on the night of the 4th. It pours down in sheets, a crash of lightning, and a roar of thunder. And at 11 o'clock, the first wagons move off. Now to escort this wagon train, which and Bowden will estimate to be 17 miles from its lead to its rear of, of, of misery and suffering. And Bowden will have his brigade, the Northwest Brigade. He will have Fitz Lee's four Virginia regiments, and he'll have Lawrence Baker commanding Wade Hampton's brigade of two South Carolina regiments, one North Carolina regiment and two legions. You will have the six guns of McClendon's battery plus another 18 guns to guard them. And this, and they move out. Now the Chambersburg, the National Road, is a macadamized road, a gravel road. Uh, before he starts, he gets orders that when he reaches uh, uh, Greenwood, he is to leave the National Road. Reports have arrived that Couch has sent men from Harrisburg and Chippensburg and has occupied Chambersburg. So the Confederates will have to leave the uh, macadamized road for a mud road at, at as you know your map, at Greenwood and cut across the hypotenuse of that right angle and strike the turnpike at Marion and move down the turnpike, the day's 11, from Marion through Greencastle, through Cunningham's Crossroads, and hopefully will reach, uh, reach Williamsport. Ken Bowden will travel with the lead column to make sure that they turn off the National Road at Greenwood. 
is a heart-rending sight as they ride by the ambulances. They can hear the moan of the suffering soldier. The screams, some of them begging to be put out of the wagon and left in the driving rain to die as they move out. It will be a night of a horrific night in the weather and the suffering. As they turn south, the road gets rougher when they come into the mud road. The wheels sinking up to their axles in the mud as they roll southward to Marion. Things will improve when they get on the Valley Pike. The road that Column has now strung out 17 miles from the rear to the head of the column. 17 miles of misery and suffering. Men will be left off at farms at the various points. And about 10 o'clock, the vanguard arrives in Greencastle. And as they do, pass through Green Castle and go south of it, moving toward Cunningham's Crossroads, Union Cavalry, led by, by young uh, Major Dahlgren, supported by partisans, will dash out, and they will use uh, branches of trees, jam them into the wheels to stop them from turning. People will attack the axles with, with, uh, with uh, the, the spokes with, uh, with uh, axes. About 25 wagons will be captured <coughs> before they repulse the partisan rangers and uh, Dahlgren's men. <coughs> They continue rolling southward. But then they're going to be struck as they pass through uh, Cunningham's Crossroads. Now the village of Prefoss, C-R-E-A-F-O-S-S. -S. When a Union column, these men again from the 1st New York Cavalry come from, come out from Mercer's, Mer, uh, uh, out from Mercer's Bay, Versus Bill, strike the column at Cunningham's crossroads, capture over 600 horses, 620 wounded men, three cannon, and a number of wagons. Before they brush them off, and Colonel Jones, Major Jones, returns to Mer Mercersburg with them. And some of those Confederates will die there in the hospital in Mercersburg. And the last of them will not leave Mercersburg for late August. By late afternoon on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, as it's getting late afternoon on the 5th, the wagons start arriving. The head of the, white, uh, the, uh, the wagon train of misery arrives. The river is in flood state. When they crossed the river at Williamsport, it had been up to the tall man's knees to the short man's crotches when they waded. But now it's 13 feet of water over the ford at, at uh, Williamsport. On the far side of the river, they find two regiments who have come north from Williamsport from from uh, Winchester, the 54th North Carolina, and the 58th Virginia with ammunition. Using the one ferry, they'll shuttle them across the river to the Williamsport side with their ammunition because they know the Union are going to be coming. The Union will come 
on the sex. Coming, leaving Frederick at daybreak on the sex will be Gilbert's division of cavalry. To encourage their man, they see a Confederate spy swinging from a limb of a tree as they ride east on the west out of Frederick. Gilbert's men, John Gilbert's men will meet with Judson Kilpatrick, all the ladies' favorite Union soldiers. <laughs> I see all the ladies smile knowingly when I mention Judson Kilpatrick. He's a widower, so he legally can be a woman's man if he wants to be. And they will confer at Bloomsburg. And Kilpatrick will head for Hagerstown, to which were a number of Confederate cavalry under Stewart have arrived, and Gilbert will head for uh, Williamsport. On the 6th, the Confederates hold the Union at bay at Hagerstown, and when Kilpatrick who Custer in the lead, joins Buford at Williamsport, he's held at bay, and the Confederates will eventually escape across the uh, river when the water begins to fall. Ewell's men at Williamsport wade in the river, now with the water up to the tall man's chin, and guess how hot deep it would be for the short man is up to the tall man's chin. And, uh, and, you, and crossing down at, at, at the falling waters on a pot. So the Confederate army escapes. The army that came north, so cocky, so confident in <coughs> success. And some of us say, when they ask him what went wrong, he says, I guess Marsh Robert just got a devil of a weapon at the hands of General Meade and his soldiers. So, and of course, in southwestern, in the north, in southeastern part of Chambers, and of your fair county, where you abut on Adams County, up near the crest of Monterey Pass, General Kilpatrick, on the night of the 4th and 5th, in a rainstorm just as bad as that that's punishing the wagon train of misery, uh, intercept the Confederates as they move to Monterey Pass. In, a, in this storm, with light flashing, lightning flashing, thunder roaring, a Maryland battery, two, a, a gun, two guns commanded by Lieutenant Emmett of the Maryland, light, uh, the Maryland battery holds the enemy at bay, but still, they will lose about 1,200 men and many wagons in the fight at Monterey Pass. And Lee's troops will arrive and pass through Hagerstown on the afternoon of the 6th. So you can see that Chambersburg and Franklin County had felt the hard hand of war. They had Confederates among their, in their county for a total of 12 days on the way up to Gettysburg. And in the preliminary of a dash into uh, by Jenkins's men. Thus plus the retreat of the Confederates back through. So, uh, 
you will have a, this is a kind of a follow-up on the events that took place during the sesquicentennial at Gettysburg that drew what, uh, drew what, uh, what surprised me. Since there was no National Commission this time, very few National Commissions, the crowds for the sesquicentennial at Gettysburg at Antietam and elsewhere in the hands of locals like you people from Chambersburg, like you from Franklin County, from Fulton County, from Adams County and thereabouts had far more significant and a much larger attendance for the sesquicentennial events than they had for the centennial events. The centennial events uh, uh, that were held were all eclipsed uh, by what took place at the sesquicentennial. Mm. That's normally not the rule. Mm. Usually the sesquicentennial. The centennial, the bicentennial, always drive better. But I think it shows that the people, the people who live on the land today as they live, their forebears lived 150 years ago, uh, were much more interested in the sesquicentennial and developing meaningful sesquicentennial events than the one, than ones under a government leadership were able to do 50 years ago. So I, I congratulate uh, what you did. One of the big ones they had was they did, they, re uh, they had tours that followed Lee's retreat from to Monterey Pass, back to uh, uh, Chambers, back to Williamsport, and to Falling Waters. So I think it surprised everybody of uh, the attendance that they had for the events 50 years after, compared to what they had 100 years after. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. about them sending cattle. Yes. You said about them sending the Confederates sending cattle and livestock and so forth back to the South. Did what they have that? you said about them sent the Confederates were sending livestock and cattle and things back to the South. Did they do that on a regular basis or or they waited until they, right. they left or what? In the period Imboden crosses of Imboden is doing it from the as is uh, is uh, uh, Jenkins. Jenkins is doing it when he's here on the 15th, 16th, and 17th. He's sending livestock back. The same way as Jenkins works his way, as uh, Jim Borden works his way across uh, southern Pennsylvania from Bedford uh, to uh, uh, to Mercersburg, uh, stopping at uh, at uh, over in Fulton County on the way. They do it. They also take large herds with them when they're retreating. So, which is a big, gives a lot of problems to the Confederates if they're driving 5,000 cattle. Think of Grandpa and a dozen men are driving hogs. <laughs> they don't drive worth a damn. So they'll be sending them to all till Lee pulls out of the area. And in, in that way, Lee will accompany one of the objectives is 
transferred supply commissary stores, which are what you eat, from the hard hit Virginia countryside and is subsisting his army and going back with a surplus into Virginia after the figure of the campaign. So that's a, that's a, uh, I'm not saying that's a, that's a plus. That's not as important as if he'd won the battle. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's something you could talk about, not make it as bad as it was. So, the, so they, they were doing it. At the same time, they're hunting down blacks the whole time. Now the Lee never sanctions it, but it's done without Lee's orders. But it's something endemic uh, to the uh, Confederate psyche that they see this as, they see blacks as property that have fled up here, even if they have been born here going back and be sold. Is there any guesstimate as to how many they recovered or sent south? No, there's no, it, it would be a sizable number. There, it's something they don't, the Confederates don't really brag about. Right? <laughs> it, it, it runs into the hundreds, but, I, but no one has ever come up with it over a thousand, was it 950, it was a significant amount. But the numbers, no one has ever uh, come up with a figure because it's something uh, you, the Confederate officers don't write. I sent X number of blacks back to Virginia. Yeah, uh, at Monterey Pass, were those uh, wagons under uh, M. Bowden's command also? At Monterey Pass. Monterey Pass. That's where they burnt the wagons, right? Now, Monterey Pass, I would talk longer about it. But it's a little further divorced and distance than we are, but it is in, uh, in Franklin County. And it was, uh, uh, it doesn't get the publicity or the interest uh, generated by the 17 miles of misery. People focus on a misery and suffering of the wounded being moved. Now, in Monterey, at Monterey Pass, they captured probably about 1,300 Confederates in that engagement there, and a large number of wagons. Uh, if they had held Monterey Pass and delayed uh, uh, Lee there for some time, <coughs> But by the morning of the uh, 5th, Joe uh, Patrick has recalled his, has gone to Smithburg with about 1,100 prisoners and no longer is holding the uh, cork in the bottle. So Lee is able to pass most of his infantry and the rest of his trains through Monterey Pass. Any other questions? At Monterey Pass, like I think Custer was there. Yes. Because somebody said that Kilpatrick fired cannon over Custer's head because he wasn't advancing fast enough. Well, Do you have any comments? Well, they, uh, I think that's probably exaggerated, but Emmick who is a Confederate hero, there is a score of men and either one or two guns, and he holds Custer up for hours. So finally, when they have got enough purchase and can bring their guns of Pennington's up on the same level uh, with Emmix, they're going to uh, then have numbers on their side. And that with that, they will, uh, uh, the Confederates will pull back and that they'll uh, run a number of wagons off that road tumbling down in there, rolling down, and, uh, uh, and Kilpatrick will 
to pull his cork out of the bottle to go down to Smithburg. And then he goes on to Boonesboro, and that opens the route uh, for Lee and his and the most of his army, uh, and, and except for the wounded train to get through to Hagerstown uh, uh, on the 6th. President Lincoln criticized Meade for not attacking Lee on the retreat. But it seems like for 10 days, well, I don't know whether Meade had control of, of what was going on or whether the cavalry, you know, his, his horsemen were able to keep the pressure on. But you know, it seems like for 10 days, you know. All right. Now, the book. Very good point. Now, one time at Boritz, uh, Gettysburg, uh, 